All right, I'm going to get started here. So uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Derek Fry. I'm the head trader of ONF Futures, Options, and Forex. Uh, I want to welcome you to my uh, uh, webinar today that's going to consist of uh, two sessions, or two sections, I guess. Uh, first is going to just be uh, kind of uh, a basic uh, walkthrough and what options are, um, how they can be used. Um, really going to just be somewhat generic. I'm not going to get into exactly specific uh, strategies on, on in, in terms of live markets, but in the second half of the session for your premium members, that's exactly what I'll be doing. We'll be walking through whatever markets you, know, you want to look at, and I will help uh, guide you to figuring out ways to devise uh, option strategies um, you know, based on your own individual risk tolerance as well as um, you know, your underlying uh, assumptions about where that market is going. So. Um, I want to keep this session open. For those of you that are regulars with my other sessions, you know that I do uh, usually do them via a completely open uh, session with questions and answers. Feel free to ask any question at any time. I'll try to address them as they come in. Uh, if it really, really slows me down, then I may save them for the end, but um, hopefully I can address them as they come. So, And don't be shy. Ask any questions about anything I'm saying at any time. Um, you know, if you have a question, Probably 10 or 20 other people in this room have the same question and just don't want to ask. So please uh, do not be shy with any questions that you have. All right. There's my little risk disclosure uh, that I have to show as a broker. Um, basically, if you do take, if I do make any trade recommendations or anything like that, and you take them, but you know you're really you're on your own um, as far as that is concerned. I'm not going to be blamed for anything. I'm really trying to show strategy here more than anything. Um, it's just an overview of what I want to address here today. Options 101, are options right for you? Um, how can a trader get started in them? And then, of course, the magic question that I get all the time, which is, are they safer? And I'll address all of these things. OK, option basics. Um, I have a little story that helped me understand what an option is, um, because a lot of people just fall apart right at that very basic idea of what exactly an option is. And uh, um, so I'm going to go through that really, like I said, basic story here. Oops. There we go. OK. Um, so the technical de definition of an option is an investment vehicle which gives the option buyer the right but not the obligation to buy or sell a particular market at a stated price, um, also known as the strike price, for a particular period of time uh, into the future or a specified date. There are two separate types of options, calls and puts. Um, a call option conveys the option buyer the right to purchase a particular market at a stated price at any time during the life of the option. And a put option conveys the, uh, the option buyer the right to sell a particular market um, at the stated price during the life of the option. Um, the strike price is also known as the exercise price. This is the price at which the buyer of the call has the right to purchase. I'm, I'm flying through this, um, but I will, I will go back here and, and get into the specifics. Um, anybody else having audio trouble? Can you guys hear me? Can you guys? OK, if anybody, if you're having audio trouble, um, Refresh on your end, I suggest, because it looks like we're OK. Um, OK. So, so let me give you this story that helped me understand years and years ago what an option really is, because uh, like I said, a lot of people have a, a options are always a, a mystery to, to most people, when they, especially when they're new to trading. Um, my purpose or goal here today is to just kind of demystify them a little bit at least because they are actually very, very, very simple and very basic. You can get super complex with them, but you can get super complex with anything and you don't necessarily need to. You know, I mean, you don't have to be able to completely, um, <laughs> we, I mean, you can't, uh, Okay, sorry about that. Um, so let me just get into this story, um, and that'll hopefully explain it. 
Um, everyone's familiar with real estate. And I, I've used this as the example, and I don't mean to make light of the current situation of the, in real estate. Um, it's just circumstantial that I'm using that as the example because that's what was taught to me 20 years ago. Um, let's say that you, um, your neighbor has a house for sale, um, wants to sell his house, and um, he's trying to play, uh, excuse me, he's trying to sell it for uh, $500,000 or whatever. It doesn't really matter, but let's just say half a million is the value of, that he wants to sell his house for. And let's say for whatever reason you believe that he's underpricing that house, and you think that you can get 525,000 for that house in the next uh, whatever 60, 90 days, a certain period of time out into the future. <clears throat> um, so you approach the your neighbor and say, "Hey, I'd like to um, buy your house, or buy excuse me, buy an option to buy your house for half a million dollars." Uh, for the next 90 days, and and I want the exclusive rights. To get that exclusive right, I'm willing to pay you, let's say, $5,000 or one percent of the value of the house. Um, so he's saying, okay, well, so that means if, if the seller of the home, uh, your next door neighbor, agrees to the option, then you have the right to buy his house for half a million dollars for the next, let's say, 90 days out into the future. Obviously, you're doing that because you believe you can get more for it. So you turn around and find a new buyer for $525,000 or whatever price it is uh, over the half a million that they, uh, they were wanting and you sell the house to that person for $525,000. You turn around and exercise your option for $500,000. The $5,000 that you paid for it goes away. The, I mean the guy who, the, who owns the home keeps it. He keeps that $5,000 in premium plus the 5000 uh, I mean the 500000 that he sold the house to you for, and you turn around and sell it to the other guy for 525000 you net a $20,000 profit. Um, that is essentially what a call option is. Does that make sense? I'm sure that there's going to be some questions around that, so please let's, let's, let's get this part of it cleared up before I go any further. It's literally an option. Um, you don't own the house. You own the rights to buy the house at a specific price for a specific period of time, 90 days in this case, you're paying five grand for it. Now, those are just numbers I pulled out of thin air, that, um, but it's just for the purposes of the example. Um, so, does that, like I said, hit me with some questions. Does that basic little story help those of you who don't know what options are or never or, or slightly know what options are? Does that help clear things up or make it any more or less clear? Okay, good. Hopefully that's clear. If it's not, don't tell me it is. Make me explain it again. I'm happy to do it. Um, so now to explain what a put option is, it's basically the same thing in reverse. Okay. Let's say you um, see your uh, neighbor's trying to sell his house for half a million dollars, and uh, <clears throat> You uh, let, me, let me see if I can use the same example. You believe that he's gonna, uh, or he believes he, he wants to try to sell it for half a million dollars, but you know that he probably isn't gonna get half a million dollars for it. Um, but you think you could probably go out and buy it, for, uh, buy that same house for four hundred and seventy-five thousand. Let's say is the best price he thinks he's gonna get for it. So to buy, to use it as a put option. Again, the put gives you the right to sell versus the call gives you the right to buy. You can turn around and say, "I'll buy a put option. I'll sell. I'll buy the right to sell your house at 450. I mean, I'm sorry, at 500, um, thinking that you can turn around and buy it in the next 90 days for 475 or something. Um, and you pay the same 5,000 dollars for that option, and you make this the same 20,000 in that way. The difference is you reverse the process. Okay, instead of buying something first and selling it later, you're selling something first and buying it back later. Uh, obviously, hopefully at a lower price." In Forex and in futures, as most of you who have been active traders in Forex or futures know, it doesn't matter. Um, the whole concept of short selling is nothing like it is in the stock market. You just sell. It doesn't matter that you don't own it. It's uh, completely irrelevant. Um, but when you do that, when you make that sale um, on something that you don't actually own, you've now entered into essentially a contract where you are obligated to buy that particular whatever it is, asset, whether it's a currency, a commodity, a stock, a bond, doesn't matter, um, 
you've, you've entered into basically a contract to buy that, uh, that, that asset uh, at some point in the future. Obviously, your intent is to buy it at less than you sold it for. Everyone knows the buy low, sell high theory. Short selling is nothing more than taking that and reversing it. Sell high and buy low. Um, there's nothing wrong with short sellers. There's, you know, I know that the media likes to vilify short sellers uh, in the stock market. That's absolutely ignorant, frankly, and asinine. Um, uh, short sellers are a very important part of the market. They're the only people that keep price in line. The reason that you have bubbles is because you have a lack of short sellers in that particular market. Um, so short sellers are in absolutely no way, shape, or form bad people. Uh, they're actually very good, and I'm one of them, so, <laughs> so I guess I'm talking up my position. But <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so a put option is nothing more than buying the right to go short, and a call option is nothing more than buying the right to go long. So I hope that I've spent enough time on that to make sense of it. Um, so let me move on. An option buyer uh, is the person who acquires the rights conveyed by the option, the right to purchase the underlying futures or forex contract if the option is a call, or the right to sell the underlying futures or forex contract if the option is a put. That's what I just went over. The seller, on the other hand, now, of course, there's, uh, uh, you can buy options or you can sell them short as well. Just like you can sell the euro short um, in forex, you could sell a call in the euro short or a put in the euro short. So. I don't want to spend too much time on short selling options because it's a whole other side of the equation. Um, and short option writers um, should only be professional investors. Small traders, new traders have zero business writing options, zero. And I mean less than zero. Um, because it, you're going to be in an inverted risk to reward ratio. Um, and uh, you know, lots of people, you really have to know what you're doing to be writing options naked. Um, if you're using them in spreads, which I will get into a little bit later, that's a little bit of a different story. But when you're just straight naked writing options, it is a very risky proposition. doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means you absolutely have to know what you're doing in terms of the risk and the risk management. Um, and it really, like I said, should only be attempted by those who truly, A, have deep pockets, and B, understand exactly what they're doing. OK, enough on option writing. Uh, the price an option buyer pays for an option uh, or and an option writer receives is known as the premium. Uh, premiums are arrived at through open competition between buyers and sellers according to the rules of the exchange or in spot lack of an exchange where the options are traded. Basic knowledge of the factors that influence option premium is important for anyone considering option trading. Premium can cost significant uh, premium costs can significantly affect whether you realize a profit or incur a loss. So I'm going to get into um, How, how options are priced in a minute. And it's actually, again, it's pretty simple. Um, there is a, you can get very complex into option pricing, but there's a, a, a fairly simple way to figure it out as well, and that's what we'll get into. Uh, expiration is simply the last day on which the option can either be exercised or offset. Um, <clears throat> be uh, certain you know the exact expiration date and time of an option, especially in Forex. Um, Options often expire during the month prior to the delivery. That's in futures. In forex, they, they expire in the uh, in the month that they're uh, they're written. So a March option is going to expire in March. Once an option has expired, it no longer has any rights. Cannot be either exercised or offset. It's basically just gone. It ceases to exist. Options are a what's called a, a time wasting asset. In other words. Each moment that an option exists, it loses a little bit of its value because it has a set expiration date when it's going to be expiring. And each minute that, that elapses, we get closer and closer to that expiration date. And therefore, the value of the option is losing a little bit each day, uh, each minute, really, um, even when it's going your way. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of. And I'll get into all this as we move forward here. Uh, quotations, premiums for exchange traded options are reported daily in the, the papers. The, the uh, options on Forex, I'm going to show you a little later here on the platform. <clears throat> now, this stuff about exercise, uh, there's two styles of option exercising. One is called American, and one is called European. And you don't really have to know a lot about this 
if all you're trading is Forex options, all you have to know is they're all done via the European method, which simply means you can only exercise them on the date of expiration. So if the expiration date is March, uh, or, or for the April Forex options, the expiration date is April 17th. So if you buy an option, you cannot exercise it, whether it's a call or put, whether it's in the money or out of the money, it doesn't matter. You cannot exercise it until the day of expiration. If it's an American style option, which are how the futures options are traded, in this country at least, then the option, you can exercise the option at any time uh, in the option's life, not just on the expiration date. It is a, uh, a meaningful difference between the two, but um, it's not a huge, huge deal either. I just, just want to explain that briefly. But since this is primarily about Forex options, let's just um, all understand that the expiration uh, I mean, the exercisability of them happens on the date of expiration, and that is the only time. However, and you do not, that, doesn't now, that does not mean you need to hold the options to expiration, and that's what the next piece is here, offset. An option that has been previously purchased or even previously written um, can be liquidated at any time prior to expiration by making an offsetting sale or purchase, just like a spot trade. If you sell the euro today at one whatever, uh, you know, at 150 something, and you want to buy it back in five minutes, in five hours, in five days, in five months, whatever it is, you can offset at any time. Um, same thing with an option as long as it's prior to the expiration date. April options expire April 17th. If you buy a put today in the euro and it goes your weight between now and five o'clock and you want to exit, go ahead. You can exit. Um, or, you know, or you can exit tomorrow, the next day. It doesn't matter. You can always do an offsetting trade. The only thing that you're... that uh, has anything to do with the exercise or, or the expiration date is the exercisability of the option. And when you exercise an option, all you're doing is saying, okay, um, for instance, let's say a 155 put in the euro, and let's pretend today is the date of expiration. You would simply be saying, okay, well, now you assign me a short position in the euro from my strike price of 155, and that's all. And you could simply, if the market's below that, which it is right now, of course, you simply buy a position to cover it, um, and, and that would be another way to offset. Okay. There are three, if you've looked at options for five minutes, you've probably heard these three terms, in the money, at the money, and out of the money, Eight, sometimes called I, ITM, ATM, and OTM. Um, very, very, very simple to understand. <clears throat> let's let's keep using the Euro 155 put as the example, just because it's a nice even number, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Euro. Um, and I'm going to start with the middle here instead of the top, if my mouse will let me. There we go. Okay, add the money here. An option is said to be at the money if the underlying price and the option's exercise price are the same. So that simply means if you own a 155 put and the market's at 155, then your option is at the money. If it's anywhere else, then it's not. Um, you know, so at the money is not a really big deal. Then there's in the money and out of the money. And the easiest way to look at this, the, the way I look at it, frankly, is simply an in the money option is one that has real intrinsic value. So for instance, let's say the euro is at 154. I'm not looking at the chart, so bear with me. Let's just say the euro is at 154 and you own a 155 put. That means you have the right to sell the euro at 155. Well, if it's at 154 right now, then there's a, then you have 100 points of potential profit um, because you can buy the euro at 154 at this very moment and you also own the right to sell it at 155 by, through the purchase of that put. So that option would be said to be in the money because there is real value there. Um, it's not just out of the money value, which I'll go over that now. A call option, or excuse me, a call or put option whose exercise price is um, above in the case of a call or below in the case of a put, the underlying price, it's said to be out of the money. So in other words, let's continue to say that the euro is at 154 even. If you own a 150 strike price put instead of the 155 that I just used in the last example, then you would own the rights to sell uh, the euro at 150. Well, if the euro currently is at 154, of course you don't want to sell it at 150 because it's 400. You'd be down 400 points. 
So that option is said to be out of the money. It doesn't have any intrinsic value. It simply has time value. The time between today and the expiration date is the only value that that option has because it's theoretically worthless because, again, it's out of the money. And again, that doesn't make it bad. Um, it's just drawing the distinction between in and out of the money. Now, <clears throat> let me get back to a, a statistic that I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard. Um, and it's a statistic that simply says something, the, the number is different. I've heard all, anything from 75 to 95, but whatever the number is, uh, let's split the difference and say 85% of all options expire worthless. Anybody heard that saying? Does that ring any bells? Okay, that's actually a misstatement or an oversimplification, okay? It's not true. Um, well, it is true in a specific sense, and that's what I'm going to point out here. When they're talking about 85% of all options expire worthless, they are only talking about these, the out-of-the-money options. At-the-money or in-the-money options, the statistics are nowhere near 85%, not even close. So that's the important distinction to draw. So don't... You know, statistics are a great way to lie, and um, that's one of the things that people kind of uh, have been, I guess, either misinterpreted, misunderstood, or straight lied to. It's not true. It's only true with the out-of-the-money options. And out-of-the-money options are, frankly, what we call lottery tickets, uh, because they're usually very cheap, and they have no value uh, until a, a big move happens in the underlying market, whether it's a put going to the downside or a call going to the upside. Either way, you're expecting a big, big move. So trading out of the money options. And most people who lose money with options are trading out of the money. And one of the biggest frustrations that people have with trading options, and I hear this all the time, is I bought a, a, a call in the euro, let's say. The market went up, and I still lost money. The reason that that happened is because they bought an out-of-the-money option, a way up probably out-of-the-money option, um, and the market simply didn't move enough um, to make them any money. So when we trade options here at our company um, and make recommendations to clients, we're always buying at or in the money options. Once in a blue moon, we'll buy something that's slightly out of the money, but the further out of the money an option is, the less probability it has of success. It's inversely correlated. Okay. The arithmetic of option premiums. Um, this is going to be a very over, I don't want to say oversimplified version, but a very simplified version. I'm not going to get into the whole Black and Scholes model because some of you know that uh, may, may know that that's how options are, are currently priced. And those of you who are advanced also know that that model is flawed. And we're actually in the process, it's been a long process, but we're in the process of slowly rolling over to a new model. There's a binomial model, and there's a couple other models that a number of different economists are working on. Um, you know, and uh, we'll see what, what they come, which one they come up with, uh, come to a consensus on. But for now, Black and Scholes is all we have, and um, it is, you know, the one that, that, uh, that the option market makers, for the most part at least, are using to help price the options. Um, so anyway, I don't need to get into that. Um, and let me back up real quick and say this. Again, option trading can be very complex. And I'm sure some of the things I've already thrown out seem very complicated. But when, when, as I get through this presentation today, you'll, I hope at least that you'll see you know, by the end of it that it still can be very easy. And I'll use this example. I used it before. Those of you that are regulars probably hear, hear, have heard me say this a hundred times. You know, I have no idea how a car works. You know, I have no idea. Okay? And I, I, I'm not a mechanic. I could not fix one. But I can drive one. I know how to drive a car, and I'm actually a pretty good driver. Right, well, my, my wife might not say that, but I think I'm a good driver. <laughs> um, so, uh, so options are the same thing. You don't necessarily have to know every single thing there is about I, the, all the little nuance within the option world, all the little crazy things that I might know, you don't have to get to that level to be able to be a good, solid, effective options trader. Um, as long as you understand the most important part, which is managing your risk. And that's important in any trade. I don't care if it's options, stocks, bonds, futures, or, it doesn't matter. If your first priority is not managing your risk, it's, you're, you're just taking time bomb. It's, it's only a question of when things are going to blow up. 
And sometimes even the best laid risk management plans don't work out. I've certainly had times, even recent times, when risk management plans unfortunately didn't pan out and you know you end up taking larger losses than you would like. Uh, the markets can gap, as you know. Um, you know, stops can be filled at much worse prices than you anticipated when they gap, and you end up losing more money uh, than you anticipated. It does happen. It's an unfortunate reality, but it is reality. <clears throat> um, so anyway, let me... Uh... Okay, Polly has a question here saying, buying uh, e ITM and ATM in the money and at ATM uh, at the money options, isn't it very aggressive? Actually, no. Um, it's more conservative. Buying out of the money options is more aggressive because you need greater movement. It's all, you know, it's all a, a measure of probability. The more movement you need in a market to make money, the less probable it is of success. I mean, think it's just, I mean, I'm sure you guys, I'm sure I'm stating the obvious there. You know, if you need the market to move 500 points for you to make a profit, obviously your probability of success is lower than somebody that needs it to move 50 points to make a profit. So if you're trading the out of the money options, it's very aggressive because you need more, um, uh, more movement to realize a profit. What I think you're referencing, Polly, is the fact that the in the money or at the money options are going to be more expensive. Yes, they are. They are going to cost you significantly more. But that, again, you are trading risk to reward for probability. Because, you're, because the options are either in or at the money, they stand a much statistically higher chance of success. Does it mean they're going to work out? I can't promise they're going to work out, but it means that statistically speaking, you have a greater chance of success. So, um, so to get that greater chance of success, you're going to pay more money. No one's going to give you the probability of success of uh, of uh, you know 80% probability of success and charge almost nothing for it. They would be fools, and they'd be out of business in about five minutes. If you're spreading poly, that's correct. If you collect, if you're talking about collecting premium, then you're talking about spreading, where you write a uh, buy an ITM or ATM, buy an in the money or out the money option, and you write an out of the money option. That's exactly the kind of strategy that I do, um, and that's exactly the kind of strategy that I'm going to get over, uh, get I mean get into uh, this afternoon. And I mean specific this afternoon. I'm also going to get into it here uh, in a minute. In fact, let me speed up here. Okay, the, uh, oh wait, at the time you purchase a particular option, its premium costs uh, maybe $1,000. A month or so later, the same option may be worth only $800, $600, $700, or it could be worth $1,200, $1,300, $1,400. Since an option is something that most people buy with the intention of eventually liquidating, hopefully at a higher price, obviously, it's important to have at least a basic understanding of the major factors that influence the premium for a particular option at a particular time. There are basically two. Um, the first is known as intrinsic value, and the other is known as time value. Um, and the total premium is basically the sum of these, the intrinsic value versus the time value. And again, this is a little bit of a simplification, but it's, again, you can, knowing just this, you can trade options. Uh, now, a lot of people may ask and, and, and want to get into the whole Greeks, the delta, the vega, the gamma, the RHO, theta, um, and all that. I can tell you, honestly, I traded options for over five years successfully, and I never knew what the Greeks were. Never, I mean, I knew that they existed, but I never understood them. I tried to read it in books. This is, you know, this is 15, 10, 15 years ago, whatever. But I didn't understand it for a very long time, and I was still able to trade them um, successfully. I, again, as lo so long as I understood the risk, the underlying risk involved, it was, I was okay, and I always did, and always do. Um, so. Don't necessarily worry about all those Greeks. You don't have to know, you know, understand theta, gamma, vega, and all that if you're simply using some of these basic strategies. If you're getting into the very complex strategy, then of course you're going to want to know some of those things. But you've got to walk before you run. So I'm just trying to get you guys to be able to maybe just crawl, even not even walk yet. <clears throat> Yeah, and CVJ, that's a great point, and thanks for bringing that up. Uh, CVJ says perhaps having all the knowledge uh, of information—I mean, all the knowledgeable information of options—can be detrimental. Simplicity um, can be and usually is effective for most people. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, keep it simple, stupid. The Kiss method um, works more often than it doesn't. Um, you know, don't 
Don't build such a huge wall in front of yourself in terms of being able to use these tools. Um, you know, a lot of people, I have clients now that I've worked with for years that have been, you know, constantly call me and say, what can I do to help minimize my risk or manage my risk in this trade? And I say, we, we will use an option. But they don't understand options and don't want to take the time to learn them or take the time to let me teach them. So unfortunately, they never use them and their risk parameters end up being a heck of a lot wider than they should be. Um, so anyway, but don't, well, all I'm saying there is don't let that, don't build up a big wall because some of these things that hopefully by the end of this presentation, you can at least effectively use them to manage risk um, and uh, do a little bit of spec trades as well. <coughs> Oh, Andrew, assessing risk without knowing the Greeks is easy if you're buying, uh, if, you're, if you're doing debit trades. If you're buying calls or puts straight or if you're doing debit spreads, your risk is simply whatever you put into the trade. No more, no less. If you pay $500 for an option, I don't care what happens after that moment. You cannot lose more than that $500 so long as you're long the option. If you're short the option, it's totally different and I'm not going to get into short selling today like I already said. But if you're buying calls and puts, if you pay $500 for that call, and, and it's in the euro, I don't care if the euro ceases to exist. I don't care if Europe sinks into the ocean. Um, it does not matter um, what happens. Um, your risk is that $500. No more, no less. It can never shift so long as you're long the premium. The probability of exercise in assignments, again, 9 out of 10 traders, more than that, 9.9 .9 out of 10 options are offset before they're exercised. You should rarely, if ever, carry an option to, ex to expiration. Ex there's only a few specific cases where you would hold an option through expiration, and I will get into that uh, a little later. But besides those few rare occasions, you should be exiting. If tomorrow's expiration and you're in the option, and you're, whether it's a, uh, if it's profitable in any way, shape, or form, then you need to be getting out of that option before tomorrow's expiration. If it's not making you any money, then you can just let it go and it'll expire worthless and the money you originally put into it is, is gone. <clears throat> yeah, Chuck brings up another good uh, point. He says he tried to understand the Greeks and advanced strategies and did better just simply trading calls and puts. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. And even the Greeks are very, very simple. I hate to say that, but they are very simple to explain. And I can do an advanced class down the road from here that's all about the Greeks and, and uh, explain it in, in pretty short order. It's not nearly as complex as some people might think. When you place the trade, you need to know the probability of expiration, etc. Well, sure, that's easily calculable, but unless you're 100% asleep at the wheel, um, you know, you should be able to, you know, be watching when you approach expiration, at the very least, or, you know, when while the market's, I mean, while you're in the trade, you want to manage it like any other trade. But the key is, again, if you pay $500 for that option, that's it. That's what's at risk. It cannot go up. So long as you exit before expiration, or at expiration. Buying a put is the same. Yeah, buying, buying a put or, it doesn't matter if it's a put or call. If you're buying the option, period. If you're, pay, if you're buying an option, whether it's a call or a put, doesn't matter. But so long as you're buying it, that's the key distinction, not selling it. But if you're buying it to open a new position, then your risk is completely defined to whatever you paid for it. That's it. And again, like I said, I don't care if it goes up 2 trillion points, goes down 2 trillion points, ceases to exist, falls off the face of the earth, it does not matter. Premium paid for an option is the full amount of money that's at risk uh, until the expiration date. All right, oops, I keep clicking on that. Okay, uh, intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is the amount of money, if any, that could 
<coughs> currently be realized by exercising the option at its strike price and liquidating excuse me, the acquired position at the present price. So let me use the uh, euro example again. And I'll use it from the call side, because I know every time I use puts, it makes it more confusing for people. So um, let's say you buy a, uh, a 155 call option. And then now let's just pretend that the euro is still at 158, OK, or 157, whatever. Let's say 158 for simplicity's sake. And you own a 155 call. Can anybody tell me how much intrinsic value, if you own a 155 call, and the market's at 158, how much intrinsic value does the option have? You got it. Three full cents, 300 pips, however you want to look at it. That's exactly right, guys. Um, so if the option's actual price is 400 points on the day that you're looking at it, then you know um, that if a 155 call is currently valued at 400, and the market's really only at 158, then you know that your option has 300 points of intrinsic value and 100 points of time value. Does that make sense? OK, hopefully that makes sense. And, and again, an option that has intrinsic value is said to be in the money. You cannot have an out-of-the-money option that has intrinsic value. It's mathematically impossible. That's like saying 2 plus 2 equals 0. Um, <clears throat> an option that does not currently have intrinsic value, again, is said to be out-of-the-money and is completely comprised of time premium. So when you buy an out-of-the-money option and the value is $500, let's say, that's all time premium. That's it. You're paying $500 for the rights to buy whatever the underlying market is at whatever the underlying strike price is for whatever the period of time into the future is, and that's it. You're buying you're, an option when you buy out of the money options, even in the money options for that matter, but it's, it's, a, it's easier to see with the out of the monies. When you're buying an out of the money option, you are literally buying time. Okay, time value. Options also have time value. In fact, at any, uh, if a given option has no intrinsic value, that's what I already went over, uh, it is, because it is out of the money, its premium will consist entirely of time value. What's time value? Time value is the sum uh, of money option buyers are presently willing to pay and an option seller is willing to, to receive or accept over and above any intrinsic value that the option may have for the specific rights that the given option conveys. Um, it reflects, in effect, a consensus opinion as to the likelihood of the options increasing value prior to its expiration. Do you guys ever notice, like, when you watch CNBC or Bloomberg or anything like that, a lot of times, what's up? Oh, okay. A lot of times what uh, they talk about, is, they talk about how the options market is telling us what the underlying market is about to do or, or is thinking. Um, and that's one of the nice things about options is you, you, you can measure what the mood of traders is or are about a certain um, asset, commodity, currency, whatever it is, based on the premium um, skew between the calls and the puts. So in other words, this is going to be a little complex, so bear with me, but hopefully this will make sense. Okay? Let's say there's a 155, let's say the market's, the euro's at 155 right now even. Okay? So a 158 call would be 300 points out of the money, right? It would be any, whatever value it's worth is pure time value, OK? At the same time, a 152 put is also 300 points below the market, right? So the call and the put are both equal distance from the current market at 155 even. With me so far? Um, so. Here's, here's how you can figure out if the market is biased long or short. Simply look at the 158 and the 152, the 158 call and the 152 put, and compare the prices. Because if the market's at exactly 155, the 158 call and the 152 put should be roughly the same price. Okay? Let's say they should be both theoretically trading for $500. But when you actually look up the prices, you look and you see and you say, oh, wow, look at that. The call is worth 400, whereas the put is worth 700. Well, that immediately gives you a lot of information right there. That tells you that traders as a whole 
um, are biased to the short side because there's more premium in the puts than there is in the calls. Um, that's a really good indication of telling you what the overall mood is for the underlying market. Just by that's not even trading options. That's just looking at the options data to give you a better understanding of what's going on in the market. So that's a, that's something that we do all the time here. That I do all the time is constantly comparing the equidistant calls and puts from a certain market to just ascertain what the bias is, um, whether or not traders as a whole are biased to the long or short side. And you can microanalyze it even further than that, but that alone. Uh, gives you a lot of good information. I thought if you look at futures, that gives you an indication about the expectation of the market. Ooh, uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, I could spend a whole three hours on that one alone, Polly. Uh, but the bottom line there is that's often true, but not always. And like I said, without spending hours on it, I, I, just, I can't really get into that right now. Okay, and Strat, you've seen it when you trade the OEX. So you, so you know what I'm talking about with the put call ratio. That's, sometimes they call it the put call ratio. Um, that's not quite the same thing. That's just a measure of how many calls versus how many puts have been um, traded. But uh, you can look at the premium uh, differential to figure out like I said, what the underlying bias is. The put call ratio will also tell you further underlying bias. Obviously, if traders as a whole are buying more puts than calls, then they're obviously biased to the downside. OK, Do -do 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 -do. time value. OK, next. Who determines the premium and amount? What uh, are the premium different and depends from broker to broker? OK. In futures, I'll just spend a quick second on that because I know you guys are really Forex traders for the most part. But in futures, the answer is different than in Forex. In futures, they are exchange traded. So they are always, the price is always, I shouldn't say always the same, but it's, uh, the price is, is, is uh, arrived at through the open outcry process. So the um, you know, it's, a, it's literally an open auction where guys are down there screaming at each other, just like you see on the television. Um, they're ultimately determining the options price based on open outcry. But underneath that open outcry is still the Black and Scholes model that helps them guesstimate what an option's theoretical value is. Now, there's theoretical value and there's real value. Um, real value is what shows up on your statements. Theoretical value is what the model says it should be worth. Um, and then you can get into all kinds of uh, uh, arbitrage, option arbitrage, and all that. But that's, again, those are some of the advanced strategies that only people, you know, uh, very deep, only million dollar traders uh, and up have any business trying to do option arbitrage. Um, and even them, even, even a million bucks really isn't enough. You, you gotta be, that's, that's hedge fund kind of work. Um, the average trader doesn't have the ability to do that because you just don't have the access. Um, and, and it's not an important piece of the puzzle anyway. Um, OK. So that's how premiums are arrived at. Now, are the premium different from broker to broker in Forex? Because they're not exchange regulated, the answer is yes. Um, there is no centralized Forex exchange, as you all know. Um, uh, just like when you're in your spot platform, if you're trading at OANDA and your buddy's trading at FXCM and another one of your buddies is trading at ICON and you're all trading the euro, one of you may have it 152, 53 bid at 57, one of you may have it 55 bid at 59, the other guy may have it 56 bid at 52, 58 or whatever. So the, you, you, you know you understand what I mean there. In forex, because it's unregulated, the prices do differ from broker to broker. The good slash bad news, it's good and bad news at the same time about the forex options is there's very few places that offer them in the first place. So you're really not going to have that much variance from broker to broker because there's only a couple of brokers that actually offer. There is a strat. You can get a free demo of the option, the Forex options platforms that we offer here, and that will give you um, full information uh, on the option prices. So um, I will get 
anyone who's interested in getting a, a demo version of the options platform for Forex that we have here, um, I'll get you information and before we wrap up here this, this afternoon. <clears throat> okay, let me get back over to the PowerPoint here. Uh, the three principal factors that affect, affect an options time value are the time remaining until expiration, simply the amount of days between now and expiration. Um, <clears throat> the more time it has, the more value it's going to have. Of course, like I said, you're ultimately buying time with an option, or literally buying time. And then for those of you who want to get into the Greeks, the time value of an option is technically what's called theta. <clears throat> okay. Um, the relationship between the option price and the current price of the underlying market, uh, this, uh, the further an option is removed from being worthwhile or at the money or in the money, uh, in other words, the further out of the money it is, the less value it is likely to have. And then this is known as the option delta. Uh, delta is literally the, value, the measure of change between the underlying market and the option itself. I don't want to really get into this. It is the, uh, one of the basic, um, when you learn the Greeks, the first thing that you should concern yourself with is delta, um, if you ever go there at all. But you don't have to to be able to be a good options trader. Um, but it certainly doesn't help to know. Uh, I mean, it doesn't hurt to know. Um, but like I said, I don't want to get too deep into this, these, uh, these Greeks. Volatility, um, the more volatile the market is, the more likely it is that the price change may eventually take, make the option worthwhile to exercise. Thus, the option's time value and therefore premium is genuinely, genu generally geez, higher in volatile markets. Uh, this is also known as an option's vega. So right now, okay, you guys all know that the markets are moving like mad. Um, pick a market. I don't even care what it is. Commodities, stocks, bonds, currencies, pick something. Just close your eyes and point at a market, and chances are it's going crazy. Um, that underlying craziness is, is uh, uh, the, the, the simplified way to say volatility, or I should say volatility is the fancy word for crazy. Um, so <clears throat> the more crazy a market is, or the more volatile a market is, the more premium that you're going to have to pay for the option. Uh, because the more, like I said, the more likely it is that the art market's going to move in your favor. So the guy who's selling you that option wants to be paid more because he's taking on more risk to sell you that option um, because it's moving in, in such a great magnitude that it's more likely to get uh, to go in the money. Uh, Strat, the demo's good for 30 days, I believe, but we can't extend it. You get a 50K fictitious uh, account balance, just like most demos. So... Uh, but it's real good to to, uh, to learn the options platform. All right, now here's probably one of the questions that everybody wants to ask, um, which is simply, are options safer? And like most things, the answer is both yes and no. If you are using defined risk strategies, which is what we specialize uh, here, then the answer is yes. Um, if you are selling options naked in any way, then the answer is at least theoretically no. Um, the key here, as I've always already said, is to simply understand the risk involved before entering into the, into the trade. Um, now, this is absolutely key, and I'm not just saying this for my own self-serving reasons. Um, believe me, I'm not. But, um, but uh, anyway, this is absolutely key. Find a firm that specializes in options. Most brokers know less about options than you do after this presentation, and I'm not trying to be funny there. I'm dead serious. I know guys that have been in the business for 25 years that don't know what to put in a call is. And they're good brokers, and they're good traders. They just never took the time to get into options, and that's fine. Um, personally, you know, for me, options are a great tool in my tool belt. One of my most, frankly, options are pretty much my hammer. Um, I use it for, almost, you know, more than anything, more than any other tool in my tool belt. If you are a small or new trader, then options are often a great place to start as long as the risk is clearly defined um, and the reason it's a great place to start is because of what I already said. Because whatever money you put into that particular trade is all you have at risk. You can sleep at night. You have no chance of waking up one day and saying, oh my goodness, I put $500 into this trade and I thought that's all I had at risk and I had a stop in and now it blew through my stop. I lost $2,000 or whatever. It doesn't happen so long as you're buying options. And also, don't get the idea uh, that I'm only buying options. I do write lots of options. I just want to really stress for those who don't understand what they're doing with that, not to even consider it yet. Um, but anyway, options versus spot. 
Markets can only ever do one of three things. This is, this is one of the uh, epiphanies that I had about uh, 15 or so years ago, maybe 12, I don't know exactly, 12 or 15 years ago um, when I first really started getting into options in a big way. This was the epiphany that I had. Um, simply, like I said, markets can only ever do one of three things, go up, go down, or go nowhere. I realize I'm stating the obvious there, but sometimes you need to. Uh, with futures or forex contracts, you can only ever make money in one of uh, those three possibilities, really only two. Um, long positions make money if the market goes up. Short positions make money if the market goes down. Nobody makes any money if the market stays flat or goes nowhere. <clears throat> So immediately, if you're putting on long and short spot trades or futures trades or stock trades, I don't care what market it's in, it's irrelevant. But if you're picking direction with a contract, you have a one in three probability, a sim with, you know, without getting into the complex probability, but to take it to the very simplified level, you have a one in three chance of being right. So, you, so if you want to flip that around, if you're a glass half empty kind of guy, you have a two in three chance shot of losing. Um, because if the market goes nowhere, you don't make any money. And if the market goes the other way, you lose. So you only really have one, you know, 33% chance of success um, on a very simplified probability level. Options, um, and in particular option spreads, allow you to profit from many other eventualities. For example, you can construct, construct spreads that make money in both a rising or a flat market. So you could have a trade that can make money if the market goes up or goes nowhere. So now you've immediately put the odds, flipped that equation around. You now have, you know, again, since there's only one of three things it can do, you're now putting yourself in a position to make money if it go, does two out of three eventualities rather than one out of three. You can construct a, a spread that makes money in both a falling or a flat market. You can construct a trade that simply makes money if the market remains inside of an established range, and you can still do that with defined risk. Um, you can construct a spread that makes money no matter which direction the market moves, as long as it moves somewhere in a fairly big way. The possibilities, are, frankly, are endless. Um, you can construct uh, option spreads to fit just about any outlook that a trader has. Did you make any money if you are in, a, in the fault of a strangle, a long strangle, for example? In the flat, I mean. No, uh, I, 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 if, I, if I'm reading your question correctly, Polly, you're saying if, if you were in a strangle or a straddle and the market's at your strike prices or in between them, um, then no, you will not make any money at expiration. That's what the, you know, the, the definition of it. And I'm going to get into these specific strategies here in just a minute. So maybe it's easier if I just get there. <clears throat> okay, putting all this to use. To answer the question, are options right for you requires some self-examination. Are you willing to spend the time that it takes to learn about options? Remember, Ben Franklin said that any person can become an expert at anything in less than one year if they just spend 15 minutes a day studying it. Can you find 15 minutes in your day? It really isn't, like I said, that hard, and you can do it in a lot less than a year. You can compress this into a, you know, into a, a few weeks or a month. It's uh, Frankly, not even that long. You could probably get through the basics in a few days. Getting started can be as simple as typing the phrase options trading into Google or using our website as a good resource. And I'll, I'll show you some stuff on our website that you can use in just a minute. Most library books also have lots of books on options that can be a good way to get started as well. Obviously, they're also free. Um, there are major, and all the major exchanges, I realize most of you guys are Forex traders, but realize that every, I'm, a, I'm, a few, I'm originally a futures trader, okay? I tra I've traded futures my whole life since I was 18 years old, and, uh, and I'm, I'm 35 now. And it took me exactly two tenths of one tenth of a second to become a forex trader. Okay, um, all I had to do was learn the word forex and know the different contract sizes. Um, so every single thing that you guys know in forex can be, and ultimately came from really futures trading, because it's been around a lot longer than forex has. Um, so you don't be afraid to go to the futures exchanges and look and read stuff about options on futures. Just every time you see the word futures, you can even see in this presentation, I've, had, I've used this presentation for futures and forex because it's all interchangeable. Again, the only difference between the, the two is that American style versus European style expiration, which all you got to remember is if you're trading forex, you can only exercise on the date of expiration. If you're trading anything else, uh, I mean, if you're trading futures, then you can do it anytime you want. Um, 
that, that's the only real primary difference between the two. Uh, getting started trading options. After spending some time getting familiar with the basics, it's time for your first trade. Paper trading is obviously a good way to learn the basics, but don't be fooled by the results. Paper trading results are always better than real trading results. There is no real uh, emotion involved because there's no real money involved. Something changes chemically in our brains when real money is involved. So like most things in life, there ends up being no substitute for real experience. Sooner or later, you've just got to take the plunge. I'm not suggesting you get in there without understanding the risk. Uh, I'm just saying, sooner or later, you know, you got to buy your first call or your first put, and 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 start uh, and start trading. And uh, the paper trading, I'll just say, you know, a lot of people paper trade and have very good results, and then wonder why their real results are not nearly as good as their paper trading results. And for those that have been wondering why, there's your answer. That's why. It is a chemical process inside of of your brain. Um, and there's no way to there's no way to fool your brain. So, <clears throat> and again, I can't stress this enough. When you are ready to take the plunge, find a firm that specializes in option trade. Because if you make a mistake trading an option and you sell a call short instead of buying a call long, then all this defined risk stuff that I'm talking about is out the door. Um, so, it's very very important that you get somebody who actually knows what they're doing with options because. A lot of guys will say, oh, yeah, we can trade options for you, no problem, blah, 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 blah. But they don't even understand them, and you know, that's how mistakes are made. So make sure that you find somebody who, uh, like us, who truly understands options. How to hedge an existing trade with an option. This can be done anytime you want to lock in your gains or offset your loss without actually exiting the trade. If long the underlying market, buy a put to protect. If short the underlying market, buy a call to protect. Advanced traders could also write another option to pay for the option that is bought. In this specific case, so long as you leave the entire trade on, again, as an overall spread, and this is one where you're combining a spot trade with option trades, even though you're writing an option, your risk would still be completely defined. Um, and I'll get into that here as we get into the strategy stuff. Um, how to trade Forex options together to maximize trading opportunities while minimizing risk. The long simply take a long Forex contract and at the same time buy a put with a strike price as close to your entry price as possible. So in other words, if you want to buy the euro long at 155 in spot, and instead of running a stop at 154 because you're afraid you're going to get whipsawed out, you can turn around and buy a 154 put. Say you pay $800 for the put. Um, now your risk is completely defined to the premium you paid for the put plus the difference between your entry point and your strike price. So in this case, you'd have uh, 180 pips at risk in that example. The key is that you can't get shaken out. The market, if you are long from 155 in the euro and you own a 154 put, your risk is completely defined in that example if you paid 80 points for it. In this example, your risk is completely defined to 180 points. I don't care if the euro goes to zero. It doesn't matter. Your risk is completely defined. You cannot lose more than that 1,800 bucks or that 180 points. And you can't get stopped out, and you can't get shaken out. You can't get panicked out. You can't get whipsawed. For those of you who are, are sick and tired of getting whipsawed, this is your solution. It's not a perfect solution, but it is a solution. Uh, for short, you simply do the opposite. You sell a contract short, and at the same time, you buy a call with a strike price as close to the entry as possible. OK. Next thing I want to do is start showing some of these strategies. And that's going to bring out a lot of these questions, a lot more questions, I'm sure. And it's go also going to uh, hopefully uh, elucidate some of these uh, things that I've been at least talking about here. Markets can only ever again do one of three things. Go up, go down, or go nowhere. With futures and forex contracts, you can only do one of the three uh, options. Like I said, in particular, the spreads, you can construct things that go up, down. Oh, I put this slide in twice. I'm sorry. OK. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. Now let me pull up the option strategy stuff that I got ready for us here. Where did I put it? Oh, it's right there.
Okay. All right. This, first of all, hopefully you guys can see this. You should see now. Now a, a little page that says uh, 21 proven strategies for trading CME options. CME is just a Chicago Mercantile Exchange. They're just the ones who ultimately wrote this book. But the, like I said, the strategies apply to any market. Futures, Forex, stocks, bonds, doesn't matter. Options are options are options. Okay. So this is, um, can you guys see this? Is this coming through clearly? Is it blurry? Um, I just want to make sure that you guys can, uh, can see this because this would be a lot of good stuff. Blank. Well, that's not good. How about now? Okay. Hopefully, you guys can see it. If not, call it out. Okay. All right. So this again is the simplest option strategy that you can do. Simply long a call or buy a call. And when to use? When you are very bullish on a market. The more bullish you are, the more out of the money. Uh, should be the option you buy. No other position gives you as much leverage advantage in a rising market with limited downside risk. Profit increases as the market rises. At expiration, break-even point will be the option exercise price plus the price paid for the option. For each point above the break-even, profit increases by an additional point. So let me say that in English, okay? Um, who, uh, let, let me give you an example. Well, here, let's do a little pop quiz. Um, if if you buy a uh, or excuse me, if you own a 155 euro call and you paid uh, $500 for it, what's your break-even point? I should have a prize for the first person who answers. But <laughs> anyone, anyone got that? Yeah, yeah, Andrew, uh, you got it. It's it's the five hundred dollars plus the strike. Uh, yep, there you go, Rosemaria. It's fifteen fifty, uh, one fifty five fifty. I mean, so your break even point. If you pay five hundred dollars for a one fifty five call, your break even point at expiration is one fifty five fifty. So that simply means you need the market to be above one fifty five fifty at expiration to realize a profit. Now, now let me confuse you. <laughs> uh, if it's before expiration. Let's say that you have uh, 30 days before expiration and the market's at 155.25 and you just bought your option yesterday when the market was at 155 even. Well, that option's going to have a profit in it. Um, and you don't necessarily need to uh, wait for the break-even point to be, to be uh, exceeded. And that's because of the excess time value that would be involved in the option. Uh, but the bottom line there is, when you're calculating your break-even point, you always simply assume uh, the, that you're at the date of expiration, because otherwise it's very difficult to calculate, and it literally changes every second. Um, but it doesn't change at all on the date of expiration. It's always the same thing. All right, loss characteristics. The loss is limited to the amount paid for the option. Maximum loss is realized if the market ends below the option strike price. So if this is 155 right here, um, this white line, and the market expires below 155, then if you bought a 155 call, it's going to expire worthless, and whatever money you paid for it is what your max loss is. Again, can't be more. I don't care how far below the line it is. You bought a 155 call, you paid 500 bucks for it, and the euro's at 110, you're still out 500 bucks. If it's at 90, you're out 500 bucks. Doesn't matter where it is. Decay characteristics. This is getting into the time decay. Position is a wasting asset. As time passes, the value of the position erodes towards expiration. If volatility increases, increases erosion slows. As volatility decreases, erosion speeds up. That's a little explanation of how the Greeks are actually functioning. Um, for those who want to get into the Greeks, I'll just say it in Greek format. Uh, the theta is con uh, what they're really saying here is um, as vega increases, theta decreases, and as vega decreases, theta increases. So theta and vega 
are inversely correlated for those that are into the Greeks. And for those who don't understand what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It's not, in, not important. And I know you may think I'm crazy for saying it's not important, but hear me now and believe me later, it, it's not. Not for the basics. Okay, short a call I'm going to skip. You should not be shorting options, like I said, unless you know what you're doing. Long put, when to use, when you are very bearish on a market. The more bearish you are, the more out of the money or lower uh, the option you buy. No other position gives you as much leverage advantage in a falling market with, again, limited upside risk. So for those of you that are bearish the euro like I am um, and bearish, uh, well, just about any currency against the dollar like I am, um, you would be looking to purchase puts in the euro, puts in the Aussie, puts in the Kiwi. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else. Well, those, those would be three good ones uh, if, you, if you're bearish. Okay, profit characteristics, same thing as the call, except it's flipped around. Profit increases as the market falls instead of as it rallies. At expiration, the break-even point will also be the expiration price plus the price paid for the option. Um, for each point below the break-even point, profit increases by an additional point. Uh, again, same thing here. The loss is limited to the amount paid for the options. Max loss is realized if the market ends above the option strike price. So again, if you buy a 155 euro put and the market expires above 155, again, I don't care if it's 165, 185, 250, 7 million, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, if you pay $500 for that put, that's how much you lose at expiration as long as it's not below 155. If you paid $500 for a 155 put, Anybody want to call out the break-even point? You got it. Yep, 149.50. Or, I'm sorry, uh, no, 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 140, uh, well, sorry, 154.50. It should be. Alan, you may have been thinking of 150 even. So the strike price, I mean the break-even point on a 155 put that you pay $500 for is 154.50. Hey, it's not typing. 154.50. Okay. Good job, guys. Um, skip the short put. Now I'm going to get into some spreads here. and I'm not going to go too deep into these because they can get complicated and it can get um, confusing for people. But how many of you are stock traders? Just hit a key, any key, and hit enter if you've traded stock before. I don't care what key it is. I just want to see how many of you are experienced in the stock market or have experience in the stock market. Okay, so it looks like a decent amount of you have had some experience in the stock market. And the reason I ask that is just because it's the market that most people are familiar with. So for those of you who have had experience in the stock market, are you familiar with uh, what's called a covered call? Does the word covered call mean anything to anybody? Okay. Now, I'm just going to explain what a covered call is um, in the stock market. And then I'm going to transfer that underlying uh, idea over to uh, Forex and or futures for that matter. Being in a covered call position is, I'm going to use IBM as the example. Um, and I'm going to pretend that IBM, I don't know where IBM stock price is. So I'm just going to pretend it's trading at $100 a share. No, I do not mean margin call, Alan. I mean covered call. What a covered call is, let's say you own 200 shares of IBM at $100 a share, okay? Each option contract in, in the stock market is good for 100 shares. If you wanted to do a covered call position, you would write one, uh, one position or one call option at a strike price above 100, where above is, is, you know, is, is a decision that only the trader could make, but let's just say 105. Uh, for the sake of argument. So you sell a call option. You're literally, you, now in this case, you are writing an option. You're not buying it. You're actually selling it, okay? 
And that's the important distinction to make. But in this case, that's where the word covered comes in. Your risk is defined. You do not have unlimited risk um, at all in a covered call position unless you leg out, um, which if you know what legging out is, great. If you don't, stay ignorant. <laughs> Trust me, it's a good thing. Um, uh, OK, so <laughs> Andrew, that is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's uh, maybe that's a message that Elliot Spitzer didn't get. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> uh, um, sorry, you're gonna you're gonna have me laughing on that one now. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Um, sorry, no, I lost my train of thought. Oh. So a covered call position, you're long 200 shares of IBM at 100, and you want to write a 105 strike price call. And for writing that call, you bring in, um, say, $500, OK? What that means is you're selling somebody the right to call 100 of your 200 shares away if and only if the price exceeds 105. And you receive $500 for that option, OK? So here's how it's going to work. There's only going to be one of two things that happens, as usual. Either the market's going to expire below 105, at which case the option expires worthless, and you, as the writer of that option, keep the $500 that the buyer of the option paid you for that option. Okay, so that's how when I said how to increase your existing uh, your your income on your existing trades, that's when you can. This is this is where that comes in. You can write options against existing trades, and I will get specific in in, in forex in a minute. But just let me use this covered call example to get through um, the basics, because it, at least for those that are stock traders, it'll make some sense. Um, so like I said, if it expires below 105, the option expires worthless, you keep your 500 bucks that you got for writing it, and you still have your original 200 shares. And everybody's happy. You made an extra 500 bucks in a trade that went essentially nowhere. Um, and you can roll that position over every month and keep doing it over and over and over and over again until such time that it actually goes above 105. So now let's pretend that uh, today's expiration and the IBM is actually trading at 110 instead of uh, below 105. So here's how that's going to work. You bought 100 or, uh, uh, 200 shares at um, $100, and now they're at 110, but you wrote an option at 105. So on the date of expiration, the guy who bought that option from you is going to, as they say in the stock market, call away. 100 shares of stock at 105. So you are selling those shares to him at $105, even though the price is at 110. Now, what happened? Well, you made $500 on the, for the, you know, uh, or, or $5 a share, excuse me, on 100 shares. So yeah, it's $500 uh, on the underlying stock itself. And you made an additional $500 because you wrote that option for 500 bucks. And even though it expired in the money, you still keep the premium. So you literally made $1,000 on a trade in that case where you really only had a $5 move in the stock relative to your strike price. Um, so that's essentially what a covered call is. Did I do a decent job of explaining? For those of you that are stock traders that are familiar with covered calls, am I, anybody want to say, was that a, de a good enough example of what a covered call is? No response, so I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> All right, well, uh, right. The reason it's called covered call, again, is because you own the underlying stock, and you write an option against the stock at a higher price than you paid for the stock. You receive premium for writing that option that you get to keep, win or lose. And then if, if it expires, like I said, below the option, then you keep your original position. If it expires above the option that you wrote, then part or all, depending on how many options you wrote, relative to your original position is, uh, you know, is called away. <clears throat> um, it's a great way to make money. A lot of very um, successful stock traders do that. 
all the time. You know, they buy long and then they'll write uh, a portion of uh, not an entire. Uh, you know, if they're if they're long a thousand shares, they're not going to sell uh, uh, ten options. They're probably going to sell five. So they have a partially covered position, but. Um, um, but that's a great way to add additional income to your existing trades because more often than not, the options will expire worthless. Again, that goes back to the 85% that expire worthless. In this case, you are writing out of the money options. So you are selling, you are literally selling lottery tickets. More often than not, the lottery tickets are not going to pay off for the person who bought them. Therefore, the person who sold them, you, makes the money. All right. So all that leads me back to this bull spread. Um, doing a bull spread, that's right, FX newbie. You keep the $500 premium in that example no matter what happens. And if the market goes up and your stock gets called away, then obviously you're going to make the profit on the stock as well. Now granted, at 110, you could have kept the original position and not wrote the option. And, and made in that example the same amount of money, but that's just circumstantial because of the numbers I used. But, um, but the, you know, the bottom line is there is a way to create what you're ultimately trying to do is create additional revenue or income on your existing trades when you're doing these covered call rights. So let me get back over to this bull spread here. A bull spread is almost the same. Um, a bull spread is almost the same as a covered call. The only difference is in a covered call, the A point here, do you guys see my mouse? The A point that I'm circling right here would be the underlying stock that you own. Replace owning the underlying stock with owning just another call option. So in this case, let me read through this here. When do you use a bull call spread? When you think the market will go up somewhat or at least is a bit more likely to rise than fall. Good position if you want to be in the market but are unsure of bullish expectations. You're in good company. This is the most popular bullish trade. Bull call spreads are, and bear put spreads are the two most common spread trades in all of option trading, period. There is no second place. Um, the reason bull and bear spreads are so popular is because you get you get a lot of benefit from doing them. Number one, you're, if you're doing them right, your A point here is either at or in the money. You can see here it's below this white line. That's signifying that it's actually in the money. Um, now, like we said, and, and I forget now who said it, but um, somebody was talking about the ITM versus the ATM. Who was it? Polly. That's right. Polly, you were uh, asking about the aggressiveness. Um, so buying an in the money option, like I said, is going to be more expensive than if you buy an out of the money option. So a lot of people, this is where people lose. Um, people lose on, on options because they buy options based on price, not based on probability. So in other words, a lot of people say, I only want to risk $500, so just go out and buy me a $500 call option in whatever the market is that they want to trade it. Lo and behold, the $500 option is one that's way out of the money and stands statistical probability of almost zero of making any money, and that's why they lose. You, you never buy options based on price, um, uh, you know, in, uh, at least on a simplistic way. If you're doing arbitrage, that's a little different. But, uh, but you should never just buy an option based on price. You buy an option based on strike price, not the actual price. And in this example, is there a way? Okay, let me strat. Let me answer these questions real quick. Is there a way that the stock owner can lose money? Yeah, of course. If the stock goes down, the um, the owner of the stock is going to lose money based on the market going against them. However, because they wrote a call, let's go back to IBM. You own IBM at 100. You write a, 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 a call option for 105 and you get 500 bucks for it. Anybody figure out what your break even point is on your underlying position? Anyone? That one's probably going to be hard for people to think. But anyway, I'll tell you what it is it's 95. So you have risk below, you have, yeah, exactly, newbie, you got it, it's 95. Um, so if, uh, what, you know, what some people do is they'll run a stop on the underlying position at 95. So they get stopped out, they still have risk on because now they're naked, the option. But the bottom line is 
you've reduced your, your loss wherever you end up getting out by the amount of premium that you've brought in. So it's, again, it's another reason why writing calls is very beneficial. If you're a stock trader and you're currently long a bunch of stock and you're not writing calls on them, you really want to uh, look into it, at least. I strongly suggest you, you, uh, you study it because it is a great way to add to what you're already doing. Is this a dilation of your potential profit? Oh, dilution. Dilution of your potential profit, but if the profit, if the price hardly moves. If the price hardly moves, again, you're keeping the premium for the option, so it should be bringing you additional money. Uh, do, 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 do. So what is idea of options as one on stock? I guess I don't understand your question, Boyke. Maybe ask it again, and I'll, uh, I'll give another shot. Um, time is it? Okay, I've only got about five minutes left, so this is pretty much as far as I really wanted to get with these these uh, the, these spreads here, anyway. Now, for the uh, so let me just finish this up, and then I'll I'll uh, talk about what we're going to do next here. The so let me use euro as an example. If you're still bullish the euro, okay, or whatever. Uh, if you're bullish the euro and you want to put on, but but you're just not sure, you know, if if you want to plow in there with a with a straight spot contract. Uh, one way to position yourself and have your risk completely defined and have no ability to get whipsawed, shaken out, have somebody gun your stops or any of those things that everybody's so concerned about um, is to do a simple bull call spread. And to do that would be very simply you could buy, where's the euro right now? Let me give you a real number so that I can, uh, where is the euro? Okay. Oh, good. We're at almost exactly 154, so that that makes it nice and easy. So let's just uh, say that we are at exactly 154. All right. So we have 154. So let's say you know you want to risk uh, no more than $1,000. Well, if you buy spot euro at 154, and you're only risking 1,000 bucks, if it's a full-size lot, then you know you've got to run a stop at 153. All right? What's the probability of you getting stopped out? Um, 100 points away from the market in any given period of time. Well, to figure that out, all you got to go do is look at what the ATR is in any given market. You can figure out what your probability of getting stopped out is. Um, and bottom line is, I can tell you on a stop like that in the euro that your probability is high, very high. Um, so, how to get around that? Very simple. Um, instead of going long at 154 in spot and running a, a stop at 153, you buy the 154 call and then turn around and sell a higher up call. For instance, maybe a 157, maybe a 158. Um, and whatever premium, let's say you spend uh, $1,000 on the 154 call, okay? And let's say the 157 is worth $300. Well, now your net cost and also maximum risk in that trade is $700. And again, that is regardless of what happens to the market. I don't care if the market goes to zero. I don't care if it goes to $27 billion. It does not matter. Your maximum risk is the $700 or whatever the total debit was between the option that was purchased and the option that was sold. In, in this case, so long as the option that's purchased in a bull spread is at the money, and the option that's sold in a bull spread is out of the money. Sense? So, and again, you have no risk of getting stopped out. You have no risk of getting whipsawed. You can hang on to the trade indefinitely if you're willing to lose the full $700. If it goes against you, then you can hang on indefinitely. If the market breaks down and you want to exit the spread, um, you know, at a 50% loss or something, or whatever percentage cutoff point you give yourself, you can certainly do that as well. Um, you do not have to ride them into the ground, but you certainly can. And um, 
and like I said, you, you, the nice thing is you'll never get stopped out. You'll never get whipsawed. You can sleep at night. Um, you don't worry about and all the traditional things that we normally worry about as traders. So, all right, I've got to wrap it up here. So I hope this was informative. Um, I know I, uh, you know, there's there is so much to talk about with options that it's, uh, you know, there's it's hard to even get it uh, in in an hour and a half get it all in. But I wanted to just show you, uh, like I said, the very introduce you to some of the basics, and if nothing else pique your interest in options and uh, get you to understand that it is a very, very useful tool in your tool belt, um, one that I encourage all of you to really take a good hard look at. Um, like I said, the, the biggest keys are understand the risk, find a broker who understands the risk and understands options more than anything that, so that you can get help in the beginning at least. Um, and uh, uh, just take the time to, 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 uh, to look at them. They're really uh, of, I can't stress it enough. For risk management purposes, options are uh, as good as it gets, frankly. Uh, you know, because a stop is not pure risk management. You all know that your your stops can gap. The market can move through your stops, and you can get filled in a worse place than you ever expected. Uh, if it hasn't happened to you yet, it will. Um, so, um, you know, this is one potential way uh, to uh, alleviate that pressure or that stress. So for the afternoon session, I guess we're going to take a, I think it's a 30 minute break now, um, or maybe it's an hour, I'm not even sure. But uh, for the afternoon session, for those of you that are premium members, we're going to get into the nitty gritty in the afternoon. And I'm basically going to go through and do a, uh, you know, I want to do it kind of like, uh, for those that are regulars, I want to do it kind of like my normal daily session where you guys call out a market, call out a time frame, and call out a direction. And uh, I will put together an option strategy in real time with real prices and everything, um, not just theory, and uh, and then we'll look at it. And if people want to actually do the trades, that's you know that's of course up to you. Okay. All right. First of all, let me give you a couple things here. For those of you, or let me, sorry, FX Street up. Give me thirty seconds here. And I will show you guys something real quick. For those of you that want to spend some time learning about options, all right, like I already said, a really, really good free resource is on our website. All right, all you have to do, it's all free. Um, we don't charge anything for this. All you got to do is go to our website, which is odomandfry.com. I'll put it in here. That's our website. Um, sign up as a member, okay? Uh, if you haven't signed up as a member, it, like I said, it is free. Uh, you'll go to member login and click on this button up here in the top right hand corner and it's right here it says not registered yet sign up here simply sign up here and um, you know this this stuff uh, and then you'll be signed up once you're signed up you'll be able to access everything that's in the protected portion of the site so you'll log in just like I did right there and then you see our newsletters are right here um, and the trade recommendations that I just put out, but this is the part that I really wanted you to see, the Education Center. This is our Education Center. We have video training, um, we have technical analysis training, we have Futures 101, Options 101. These are all different articles I've written for different magazines. Um, if we go to the Video Training Center, there's Futures videos, there's Option videos, and there's Forex videos. So if you want to spend time, you'll notice that there's, a, there's seven different videos here all about how to uh, trade options. This is a really, really good free resource. Um, they're going to specifically be talking primarily about futures options. Again, um, besides the difference in expiration styles, everything else applies. So you can definitely, um, you know, every time you hear them say the word futures, just pretend you're saying Forex. Um, so that's a very good starting point for you guys. I encourage you all to, to you know, spend the time there. Um, even before you do that, you may want to read this Options 101. Uh, this was put together by the NFA, the National Futures Association. And uh, this is going to give you uh, a little bit more of a... Uh, in fact, some of the things that I, I... I literally copied and pasted some of the parts of my presentation right out of this Options 101 thing. So this is going to give you a little bit more of a long-winded understanding. Um, so anyway, just wanted you guys
to see that there is a free resource for you there with all kinds of very informative stuff uh, about centered around not just options but everything, but specifically options as well. Um, ZBYS, again, to get the protected section, you just uh, go to our main site, uh, www.odominfry.com, this site right here, the one that I put in. You should be able to see it on the hotcom thing. Um, click on member login on the top right, and then just sign up. It's free. It's not going to ask you for credit card numbers or anything, just your name, phone number, and uh, email address. JK, I'm going to be totally self-serving. I recommend me, <laughs> okay, for uh, for good brokers and, and online uh, platforms and stuff. We've got over half a dozen different platforms that we work with, um, so <laughs> but that'll end my self-serving stuff. So anyway, all right, you guys have a good break. Um, I'll, uh, you know, all of you premium members, I'll see you back here in about 30 minutes, and we'll get into the nitty-gritty here, like I said. And uh, let's see here for those of you who aren't going to be um, joining us for the premium session. Like I said, I encourage you to spend some time on our website, and if you uh, want to take it to the next step and start actually working on these options, we will. Um, you know, feel free to contact me. If people have questions that I missed, I know I did miss a few, and I apologize. Here is my email address.